John chapter 4. You have your Bibles or summer notes in the bulletin. And you can follow along with us. This little joke on my phone will share with you. says a lady that was 92 years old finally consented to go to a retirement community. But strictly on a two-week basis. She wasn't sure if she was going to like it or not. So she said, I'll go try it for two weeks and then we'll see where it goes. Consequently, she took a small overnight case with only the bare essentials for two weeks. The next day, her niece was surprised to get a phone call from her demanding more clothes. She said, bring me that good black silk, my lavender print, the brown wool, the list just went on and on. She wanted all this other stuff. Finally, the niece asked, what changed your mind about staying at the retirement community? And the dear old lady responded, there are men in this place. We're in part four of a five-part series called What Jesus Came to Do. What Jesus Came to Do. Let me ask you a question this morning. Who is in a better position to tell us what Jesus came to do than Jesus himself? Uh, several times in Scripture, very clearly, we're told that Jesus came to do this or Jesus came to do that. As an example, in John 18, 37, Jesus has already been arrested. This was shortly before his crucifixion. And he's standing before a government official named Pilate. And Pilate said, you are a king. And Jesus answered, you are the one saying I'm a king. This is why I was born and came into the world to tell people the truth. And everyone who belongs to me, to the truth, listens to me. So Jesus came to tell us the truth. We're living in a time when it's tough to tell f f uh, fact from fiction, the truth from a lie, right from wrong. Uh, we don't have a standard truth anymore by which we can judge what's real and what's not, we, what, what we should believe in and what's false. According to what TV channel you watch or what news you watch, you hear one thing and then you hear another. You don't know what to believe. Not only did Jesus tell us here, I have come to tell you the truth. On another occasion, Jesus says, I am the truth. I am the truth. And we can line our life up next to Jesus and we can know whether we're in line or out of line, whether or not we're living a lie or living the truth. Jesus is the truth. There's a classic example, uh, a confrontation between Jesus and a woman in Scripture that we're going to look at today. She's typically called the woman at the well. Because Jesus is at the well to get water, that's where he meets this person. And we don't know her name, so we just call her the woman at the well. Uh, in this setting, a conversation that starts flowing, Jesus tells her the truth about herself about her life, and more importantly, he tells her the truth about what he can offer to her and what he can offer to all of us. He knows she needs eternal life. It's, it's a wonderful account about this truth-telling aspect to Jesus' ministry. It's in John chapter 4. The story unfolds between verses 4 and 42. And we're not going to take time to read all of it today, so you may want to read it this afternoon when you get home. It's a very long story. So what we'd like to do is just tell you the story, and we're going to draw a few illustrations from it. So the Bible tells us that Jesus had been ministering in one area of the world, and he's getting ready to go to another city. And the Bible says a very interesting thing, where it says he had to go through Samaria. Uh, that's what the scripture says. He had to go through Samaria. Let me tell you why that's interesting. A cultural clue. Back then, Jewish people did anything possible to avoid Samaritans. They just didn't like them. Religiously, uh, there was a lot of prejudice. Racially, there was a lot of prejudice. So Jewish people who travel, some, they would sometimes travel a three days journey so that they could avoid Samaria. But this passage of Scripture says Jesus had to go through Samaria. So I wonder why. I think it's because he wanted to meet this person. He wanted to meet this lady. He wanted to see her life changed. 
He wanted to offer her eternal life. And that's exactly what happened. He goes through Samaria. He comes to this well. The Bible says that it's noon. It's in the heat of the day. Jesus is described as being tired. Can you believe that Jesus would be tired? He was fully human and yet fully God. But he got tired just like the rest of us. He sits down at the well and he's resting. His disciples go off to a nearby village to get lunch. And Jesus is left alone. And then the Bible says the Samaritan woman comes out to the well. And Jesus says to her, would you give me a drink? Well, she's shocked. She says, why is it that you being a Jewish person would even speak to me? And Jesus said, if you knew who I was, you would ask me for the water, and I would give you living water. I want you to understand a couple of things. First, I want you to understand the situation of this woman. She's coming out to draw water at noon by herself. Now, here's why that's a problem. In that culture, women would go out to the well outside of their village in the cool of the morning or in the cool of the evening. They would never go in the middle of the day. And they would never go in the hottest part of the day. And they would never go alone for security reasons. The reason this woman is alone and at midday is because she is a social outcast. That's what it says about her. She's a woman who has been shunned by her village and she's having this conversation with the Son of God. Can you imagine the miracle that took place here. He, he knew what he went there for. He knew what was going to happen. And she thinks they're just talking about physical water uh, and her physical thirst. But Jesus is starting to engage her at a deeper spiritual level. And he says, I could give you water that would meet your deepest needs. And she still thinks she's just talking about water. So she looks around and she says, well, you don't even have a bucket with which to draw the water. Who do you think you are? And he says, listen, if you drink this water from the well, you'll just get thirsty again. If you drink the water that I'm offering, you will never thirst again. I have something that will satisfy you eternally. You will never thirst again. They talk about all kinds of things. And they, they finally... They, they really get down to the crux of her life. And Jesus says, why don't you go get your husband? Come back and we'll talk some more. And the woman said, has a real dilemma. She has a, a pretty checkered past. And she says this. She says, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, you've spoken the truth. You've had five husbands. And the man you're living with now is not your husband. And she immediately tries to change the subject. All of us would do that. She says, well, let's talk about worship. Do you think that we ought to worship God on this mountain? And this is exactly what she said that she does. But Jesus says, let's not talk about religion. Let's talk about reality. Near the end of the story, she comes to believe that this person is actually, is in fact Jesus, the Christ, the promised Messiah. God's Savior for the world. And she trusts in Christ as her personal Savior. She goes back to her village and she tells all the people what she knows about this experience. And listen to what it says. The Bible says the village comes out to this well and they believe that Jesus is the Christ because of the testimony of this woman. Now I want you to pause right here for a minute and let you realize that your testimony is that powerful. You too, if you know Jesus as your Savior, you can go out from this church and you can tell your friends and your family and your neighbors what happened to you. And they too might come and hear the good news of Jesus Christ. It says the whole village came and experienced this because of the testimony of this one woman. She had no idea that afternoon when she went to that well that new meaning and new direction and new purpose would be given to her life. She had no idea how everything would turn around because she'd had a conversation with the Son of God. Uh, what would it have been like to be a Samaritan woman in that culture?
From her perspective, what would this event have felt like? Try to get inside her sandals for just a minute and see it from her point of view. And in fact, the person that she was meeting was God in the flesh. And in that encounter between her and Jesus, there are four truths that just jump from the pages of Scripture that we want to talk about this morning. If you're taking notes, four truths that this story tells us. Truth number one, the truth of it is I cannot hide my past from God. Truth number one, I cannot hide my past from God. Have you ever tried to hide something from God? Why is it that we believe that we can smuggle our sins past God? What makes us think that we think we can sneak something past the all-seeing eyes of God, the all, past the all-hearing ears of God, past the all-knowing mind of God? Why do we think that? We've been doing that from the beginning. We believe that we can just pass something by God and He'll never see it, He'll never know. Uh, back at the beginning of time when God created Adam and Eve, the Bible says he put them in the Garden of Eden and they were naked and they weren't ashamed and they were living in perfect innocence. And then when they decided to disobey God, they immediately felt shame. Sin led to shame. Shame led to secrets. Secrets made them feel like they needed to cover up. Three things that we do all the time and they're very ineffective at dealing with our sin. Three things if you're taking notes. And we're going to go through this real quick. We're not going to spend as much time on it as I thought originally because we want to move on to better things. But, but first of all, we try to ignore our sin. This is living in a place called denial. We try to ignore our sin. And we're living in denial. We try to deny that what we're doing is really wrong. The world that we live in says it's okay. So it's really not that wrong. But it is. We're in denial. Second, another ineffective way that we try to deal with this sin is through sheer determination to do good. We just try to grit our teeth and dig our heels in and try not to do that anymore and try to do good. And we try it in our own strength and we usually fail. A third ineffective way we try to deal with the sin and the problems in our life is we just give in to it. We just give in to it. So I can't do it. I, I, I might as well just do what I want to do. And we just give in to it. Uh, don't we all have this place in our life where we tuck all the stuff that we don't want anybody else to know about? A, a secret cavern in our mind, a secret trunk that's kept padlocked in our heart. And we don't want anybody to uncover or discover or to find out. And we carry it and it's heavy and it's shameful and we're afraid. And we even believe that God won't see it. And we're not doing, we're not fooling God, we're only fooling ourselves. So Jesus says, bring your husband. And she tried to dodge that bullet and said, I don't have a husband. And then Jesus said, I need to teach you something here. I know all about your life. You can't hide it from me. Jesus knew all about her shameful past. She tried to keep that secret. She lived in a culture where her lifestyle would have been considered very shameful. And, and that's the reason that she's going to the well in the middle of the day all by herself. Uh, nobody wanted to be with this woman. They, they would have been guilty by association. They shunned her, and Jesus knew about that. He not only knew about her shameful past, he knew about her repeated failure. It's not like she had just one mark on the scorecard. She had a lot of smudges. Not only did he know about the issues of her past, but he said, I know what's going on in your life right now. If this Bible story teaches us anything, it teaches us that God knows all about our past. He also knows what's going on in your life today. You cannot have your spiritual thirst quenched until you're ready to say, God, I'll just admit it. I know I can't hide anything from you. So I'm going to be truthful about it. And that's how we repent of our sins. So, so the first step you can take toward the truth is be honest with yourself and be honest with God. Truth number two, Jesus knows all about me 
and he still loves me. Jesus knows all about me and he still loves me. The very reason we try to hide our sins from God is because we believe that God won't like us. If he knew, if he knew everything that's going on in our lives, if he discovers everything about us. So we think if, if I could just hide parts of my life, then God will still like me. Does the Bible teach us that the moment God discovers things about us that he stops loving us or caring about us? Is that what the Bible really teaches? Let's take a look. This story has something to say. There's, there's one time in this conversation between Jesus and this woman when Jesus refers to her by a descriptive term. He knows all about her past, her present. He, he knows all the good, the bad, the ugly. He could have chosen to use a number of descriptive terms. He could have used a racially derogatory term and said Samaritan. But he did. He could have chosen. He could have chosen to use the term "social outcast," but he didn't. He could have said "sinner," but he didn't. In verse 21, of all the descriptive terms he could have used, he says to her very tenderly, "Woman." Jesus was the champion of women in a society that demeaned women. Uh, it, here's evidence of that. He uses this term, term of endearment. It wasn't like he was being accusatory or condemnatory. He was trying to teach her something about God. He knew everything about her, and he still loved her. Let that sink in this morning. He knew everything about her, and he still loved her. He knows everything about you and me and all of us, and he still loves us. How does that compare with your idea about God? Does that line up with how you understand God to be? Or is it a new idea about God? Most, most people believe that God would rather beat us up than lift us up. Jesus wasn't brutal like that. Uh, he wasn't accusatory or condemnatory like that. It's not only about your past, it's also about your future. That's why God loves us, because He knows what we can be, and He knows the plans that He has for our life. Every saint has a past, but every sinner, and that's all of us, has a future. We have a future. Every saint has a past, and every sinner has a future. So the second step toward truth, believe that the one who knows you best loves you most. God knows you better than anybody else, and He loves also loves you more than anybody else. Truth number three. The truth of it is, my sin has its consequences. The truth of it is, my sin has its consequences. Someone once said that sin is fun on credit. You, you have your fun now, you pay later. Uh, when we sin, we don't get to choose how much we pay. But when we sin, we don't get to pick the consequences. And we don't know what the consequences will be until after we've sinned. It's kind of like this. Suppose you go into a store. The rule of the store is if you touch anything, you have to buy. It's also true in this store that there's no price tags on anything. And you, don't, you won't be told how much it costs until you have to buy it. So you go in and you're very timid. You tell your children, don't touch anything. But then you see something that you want. And you'd like to have that. You'd like to do that. You'd like to experience that. And then the thought runs through your mind. But then I'll have to pay. And I don't know how much it costs. And you have this momentary moral dilemma. I think it will be worth it. I don't care what it costs. I'm going to go my way. And then we carry that item to the cash register and we ask with a bit of fear, how much is this going to cost me? And then our knees almost buckle when we hear someone say, that, that right there, that cost your reputation. That one, that will cost your marriage if that's what you want to do. That one, that will cost your relationship with your kids. That one is going to cost your peace of mind. See what happens? That's what we want to tell you today, sin has a consequence. 
Does Jesus still love us? Absolutely. But sin has its consequence. Well, you and I will pay a price and we don't get to choose what it is. When we sin, we pay. Sin has its consequences, but we don't get to pick what they are. Galatians 6, 7 says, What a person plants, he will harvest. How many of you have heard the slogan, You'll reap what you sow? Uh, that comes right from the Bible. This is the verse the Bible, in the Bible where it says that. And, and this is just a paraphrase of it. The person who plants selfishness, ignoring the needs of others, ignoring God, harvests a crop of weeds. All he'll have to sow for his life is weeds. But the one who plants and responds to God, letting God's Spirit do the growth work in him, harvests a crop of real life eternal life. Would you agree with me that this woman was living the consequences of her sin? All the bad decisions she'd ever made, all the good decisions that she had failed to make. Uh, think about the high price she was paying. She's all alone at the well. She's a social outcast. That's a high price. She had broken heart after broken heart after broken heart. Relational disappointments. That's a high price. She's far from God. That's what's called spiritual death. This woman was lost. And at the soul level, she is thirsty and parched and empty. And we live in a world full of people like this that we rub elbows with every day. The third step towards the truth. Understand that God loves us just the way we are. But he loves us enough to not leave us that way. He loves us enough to not leave us that way. Wouldn't it have been, would it have been loving for Jesus to know all about this woman and to say, I love you today, but then leave her in that condition? Spiritually dead and thirsty? No, he said, I love you so much. I love you right now, but I love you so much, I don't want you to stay this way. That's why he offered her a new eternal life that welled up from within like a fresh fountain of clean and pure water. Truth number four, the truth of it is Jesus is the only one who can satisfy my deepest need. Jesus is the only one who can satisfy my deepest need. In John 4.10 it says, If you knew who I was, you would have asked me, and I would have given you living water. In verse 14, whoever drinks with the water that I shall give him will never thirst again. But the water I give shall become inside a well of water springing up to eternal life. That is so, so true of how it describes what takes place when we trust in Christ as our personal Savior. He he promises us eternal life in heaven, but also abundant life here in this lifetime. All through the Bible is a picture of people like you and people like me. And we're described as being spiritually thirsty. And all through the Bible we're told that God is the only one who can quench our soul thirst. So, so sad that so many turning to themselves and coming up empty. Or turning to the things of this world and coming up empty. Psalm 42, 1 and 2 says, As a deer pants for the streams of water, so I long for you, O God. I thirst for God, the living God. Isaiah 12, 2 and 3 says, See, God has come to save me. I will trust in Him and not be afraid. The Lord God is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. With joy you will drink deeply from the fountain of salvation. And then Jesus said in Revelation 21, 6, I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. Without cost, it's completely free. You might say, I would love to have this thirst in my soul satisfied. How does that happen? You have to take the final step towards truth. You must admit your emptiness. You must admit your emptiness. You have to say, Jesus, I've tried to fill my life every other way, and I'm still thirsty. And until you realize this, 
you're going to come up short until you turn to Jesus. Can, can you be honest with yourself and be honest with God? It might take you a little while to admit the futility of your life, the emptiness of your life. It's, it is good for you to say, Jesus, I thirst. Jesus, I, I, I need what only you can give. I need what only you can give. And then you accept Jesus' offer of satisfaction. Or you accept his offer of salvation. You admit your thirst and you accept Jesus' offer of satisfaction. Lord, give me the eternally satisfying life that you promised. It's like this woman came to Jesus and just she just said, I can't get no satisfaction. When, when he described her life to her, she, she realized that he knew that she'd been looking in all the wrong places. She couldn't find no satisfaction. The woman's life has a big gaping puzzle piece that's missing. She tries everything to find a fit, something that would completely fill that place in her life. She tried the pleasure, the temporary fix. If I could just get a little something today, that will carry me to tomorrow. She lived her life sort of going from fix to fix, one pleasure pursuit to another, but that didn't fit. And we know that she tried people, a whole string of them. That didn't satisfy one loser right after another. And then on this particular day, she comes out and she found that piece that fit. There's a song that says this, Only Jesus can satisfy your soul. Only He can change your heart and make you whole. That's what she needed. He was the peace that was missing. In your life and in my life and every human that's ever lived, there's a God-shaped vacuum, a, a, a God-shaped void that only He can fill. And He's the only one that can bring completeness and wholeness your life. He's the only one that can quench the soul thirst that you have, the deepest needs that you have. Uh, the greatest soul thirst you experience is the thirst for forgiveness, the thirst to be right with God, the thirst for eternal life. We, we all crave that. We need that. And Jesus is the only one that can provide it. Jesus said in John 7, 37, if you are thirsty, come to me if you believe in me, come and drink. We're so thirsty. We're thirsty for a clean conscience. When was the last time you were able to peacefully lay your head on your pillow at night, guilt-free? No more shame. All your secrets exposed to heaven and you discover that God loves you still. But when's the last time you felt like your slate was wiped clean? Uh, when was the last time you felt like you had a fresh start with God? Uh, we do like the woman at the well. We say relationships might do that for me. Or how many of you have ever been disappointed by a spouse? Or a child? Or a parent? Or a friend? Uh, that just doesn't get the job done. How many of you thought, well, I'll just accomplish more? Uh, that doesn't, doesn't get the job done, done. How many of you think, I'll just accomplish more? I'll earn more money. And I'll be financially secure. Or I live for the weekends. Recreational pursuits. Good times. And Monday, Monday morning comes and you're still thirsty. And Jesus sits next to you and he says, I'm the only one who can quench your soul thirst. The only one who can make you right with God. And that's exactly what he's offering to all of us this morning. He's the only one that can give us this living water. Let's pray. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity this morning to look into the precious Word of God and to see that you are the truth. You came to, to, to tell us the truth. and Lord, you are the truth and the life and the way. And Father, what, a, what an awesome story or an awesome truth to see this morning and how the woman at the well had tried everything in life and had come up short and yet Jesus was there for her and he loved her in spite of her sin. He, he loved her in spite of, uh, of her wrongdoings and her, and her coming up short like we all do. And Lord, we just thank you for your unconditional love, for your mercy and grace that you've offered to every single one of us. Lord, we, we live in a world that needs Jesus. We live in a world that's thirsty and they don't even know it. And Lord, I just thank you that you 
have quenched our thirst. For those of us that have trusted in you, you've quenched our thirst. You've given us eternal life and abundant life. And Father, we just pray for those that don't know you, that they too will come to know you. We pray that our testimony would be a witness to them, that they might come and, and, and hear the good news of Jesus for themselves and trust in you as their Savior, Lord. If there be anyone here today that's never done that today, we pray that they will today. In Jesus' sweet name we pray. Amen. If you will, please stand with me, and we're going to sing our invitation hymn, hymn number 294, Have Thine Own Way, Lord.
Benny has a scan Thursday. He had cancer in his leg a few months ago, but hopefully this is all taken care of, hopefully. Uh, any others? Yeah, I'm a third grader who, um, his name's Bryson, and he has to have two open heart surgeries. He's eight years old. He has one next Monday, a week on the 30th, and then um, a week or two later, he'll have a second one. This little boy had a pacemaker. And they were hoping they could wait till Christmas break to do these surgeries, and they said they, they, they can't wait. They've got to do it sooner. Frank for Bryson? All right, anything else? It's good to have Alice with us, and Bernice again, and, and um, Derek, and Jerry, and everybody. So I'll turn it back over to Jeff. All right, we're going to sing the uh, hymn 386, The Family of God. Mm -hmm. 